Prime Ministry Monday, I'm speaking to Timothy Johnson. Hi, Timothy. How are you? Hello, I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing really well. Thank you for talking with us on Ministry Monday today. Well, you're very welcome. Thanks for the invitation. It's always yeah. exciting to talk about uh, anything liturgical, so uh, <laughs> it's always good to be here. Good, good. I'm glad to have you. Now, some of the listeners may know you, of course, from your role in LTP and the Essentials of Catholic Liturgy, but some people may not know you actually recently had a job changed and, and you moved. So can you kind of share a little bit about that? I did, yeah. At the end of October was my my final uh, days at LTP, though I will say I am uh, finishing up a few projects uh, through the, the rest of, of the coming year. And uh, just as we wrap some of that up, but um, I left LTP to come here to the Archdi the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Washington um, and as the director of the Office of Worship. So I had a wonderful invitation from Cardinal Gregory to, uh, to take on this endeavor and to accompany him in his ministry. And it was very hard to pass that up. Um, obviously, from those that do know me from the Essentials of Catholic Liturgy, they know uh, my background certainly has been in diocesan work before going to LTP. And uh, it's always just a great, uh, great ministry to get back into. And really, as I see it, as does the Essentials of Catholic Liturgy, but is, is really being a good source uh, for parish ministers, whether you're a music minister, a liturgist, uh, or both, um, but accompanying them in, in the work that they do. Um, I just, I really do love doing that. Can you give an, another example of some of the other pieces of work you're doing now in ministry in the Office of Worship? Sure. Well, I, I still rather new and still trying to figure it all out here. As, as again, listeners will know, diocese to diocese, bishop to bishop, things are always a little different. Mm -hmm. um, so, so as I'm getting my feet wet, I mean, a lot of the things that we've been doing, certainly um, we're, we're busy during the Christmas season with masses at both the Basilica uh, of the National Shrine here at the cathedral and working with the, the different uh, ministers there to uh, not only learn myself the the protocols and things here, but to uh, to make sure we support them. But a lot of what Cardinal Gregory has has asked of me so far, and what we're going to hopefully be doing as we move forward in this particular role, um, outside of the day to day, you know, needing to prepare liturgies, is doing formation and trying to um, kind of re-energize some of that within the the archdiocese, and that would include with. Uh, um, uh, music ministers, and I've already had an opportunity to uh, casually meet with with folks of the NPM chapter here that, that gathered for a happy hour, and I've been in conversations with board members in, in the Archdiocese just to see the ways that we can support one another in information and in our ministry, because uh, I don't, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to leave anybody out in that regard, but I think uh, it, it's a good uh, a good way to, to continue to connect. I don't know if that, yeah, if that's helpful or not, but. It is. And actually it's a perfect transition to the next question I was going to ask you anyway. In your opinion, why is continuing education and continuing formation important for the pastoral musician of any age or skill level? Gosh, I, I think there's a few things probably, um, we'll see what comes to my mind first. I, I think the, the first and foremost thing is, and maybe this is me coming because I love, I love the academy, I love to learn, I love to do formation. And for me in my own experience, and I, I think this is why I think it's so important for other people as well, is it continues to help me be grounded in what I do and not just you know, willy-nilly putting things together, but going back to the sources, you know, reading the pranatundas, reading the rubrics, always, you know, no matter how many baptisms or weddings I've done, or RCI is the best example I have, um, every time I open the ritual book, as a musician, as a liturgist, I read something new or read it differently than I, I did before because of an experience I've had. And I think that just helps me as a minister continue to break open the mystery, right? Um, like I'm getting deeper into that and therefore I'm able to do my ministry more effectively and more robustly because I have a better sense, a deeper sense of what the church is inviting, not just me as a minister, but what is inviting the whole people of God uh, to encounter in the celebration of our, our liturgical life uh, in that sense. So I do think it's important for that. I think it's important to also just keep up 
um, in terms of as as things change with translations, as we know over the last several years, and and we'll continue for a little bit more, um, as uh, you know, we have new some new rights coming out um, with the institution of eventually down the road, it's gonna be a while, but institution of the catechist and institution of women uh, in, in to uh, intellector. So I, those kinds of things, just so we're familiar and aware of what's available or what, what is happening in the life of the church so that we can be the best resource in our parish community. Doesn't mean we all have to have master's degrees in this, right? But it does mean we wanna accompany as best as we're able to the people in our, our pews, the people in our community that we're there to, to support them and to journey with them on their spiritual life. And if we aren't doing that ourselves, it's gonna be really hard to do with others. I think too, I personally think that the face of continuing education is changing for a lot. I mean, I think most of the workforce, but especially in pastoral music, and here's why. I mean, first off, um, many people who work in pastoral music, to be blunt, maybe can't start a master's degree, a full program right now. Sure. Um, but they may have the time commitment for something um, a little more focused, a little bit um, less in time commitment than an entire semester, maybe 12 weeks, something like that. Um, so I really do think that also, I think it makes a difference too in the life, like you said, of your parish, in the life with your clergy as well. Um, you know, if, if there's anything I think we as pastoral musicians can do is continue to work on our rapport with our clergy, our brother, you know, the, the brother priests that serve in our parish. And I think too, continuing education, especially liturgically, I do think can help continue that and foster that mutual understanding between the work of pastoral music and the work of the church at large. Yeah, I, I think you're right on target. I mean, this is a, a great, a, a great way to build bridges. And, and as you were just saying that, I was thinking to myself, even uh, as we kind of move into talking about essentials of the Catholic liturgy, and some of you have taken that, what a great opportunity. Again, as you said, it's, it's accessible. It's not very time consuming in the long scheme of things. It gives you a, a taste of, of some of what is, is needed as we continue to form ourselves in, in the liturgy. Maybe some of it's new, maybe some of it's um, familiar, but you're hearing it differently in a new way this time around and, and uh, breaking that open in, in your ministry differently. But what would, it would be very interesting or maybe even fun, I don't know, if you have a liturgy committee or music, uh, uh, like section leaders within your choir or instrumentalists or something and and maybe doing it as a group because then you have an opportunity i know we're still in the midst of a pandemic but but are there opportunities if you're doing it together outside of the class for you to think about and talk about well, what does this mean in the life of our parish because then it's not just you as the director or the coordinator but you're bringing in other people to not only form them but to also hear what their experience is in the life of that that community so i think that could be a great way to build bridges as well and we have since you mentioned priests i mean we've had priests and deacons go through both tracks one and two i don't mm. recall about track three or not partly because they just wanted to see what it was like. Um, it, and if they wanted to recommend it then for their music minister, and some just wanted to kind of have a little refresher, mostly with track two, you know, just kind of a like, you know, let's dive into this a little bit and, and just uh, just see. So, so yeah, invite folks uh, to come uh, and, and be part of, part of something like this with you. Formation, in my opinion, is always better when it's done in groups. <laughs> Because yeah. it, it, it can, it, it, it's energizing when you're with people that get excited about stuff like this. And I got to say this, and I, you're, you're not even telling me to say this. So listeners, keep that in mind the next thing I say. But Essentials of Catholic Liturgy, I really do think is very tailor-made for this time in our society. Because it really is a great source of virtual continuing formation that you guys had already established well before yeah. the pandemic forced us into Zoom, and which is a great tool, but I mean, it really has forced us into new ways of learning. ECL, Essentials of Catholic Liturgy, you guys were already doing that well before the pandemic. Right. I mean, you know, LTP at least for, gosh, almost maybe 10 years now, maybe nine, 
has been doing virtual training of various sorts. And then with ECL, we really kicked that off in 2018 when I started at LTP. We did the in-person, you know, at NPM that summer, and then the virtual experience mm -hmm. started that fall. And so, yeah, we were we were definitely uh, doing that. Um, and and I think, in my opinion, even though I don't work there anymore, um, I, I think that we have done a very good job in engaging online participation in a way that you can't do on Zoom. It's a little different because we use the uh, Adobe Connect is the platform we use. So far, the majority of people that have joined us um, for ECL and other virtual training have have just been surprised, I think is probably the right word, surprised on how engaging the platform is um, because you are able to communicate by typing and there's questions and there's videos and there's different kinds of dialogue. So you're not just sitting listening to a lecture, though if I were there, that. I try not to, but I like to talk. Um, but but there's a lot of different you know, ways that that we engage um, in that platform, and so I think it, it's a good it's a good structure, a good model for adult learning um, in a virtual setting, especially if if we have to do it virtually. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's start at the beginning. For someone who's listening and may not know anything at all about the Essentials of Catholic Liturgy. What is the Essentials of Catholic Liturgy? Great, yeah. So the Essentials of Catholic Liturgy was uh, a brainchild of LTP in conversation with NPM um, and, and, and partnership now with, with NPM. And the idea was really to provide a three-track, um, so each track, there's three tracks, has six sessions to it. And the idea was to provide basics uh, for not only new musicians in the parish, um, but those who have been in music ministry, maybe not even Catholic, um, who just wanted a, either refresher or to gain some really basic knowledge about the liturgy, not just about music planning or things like that, because that's part of it, but like, well, what does this mean in the rite of baptism? Or what is the Roman Missal? And I know maybe for some listeners that, that sounds ridiculous, but it's not like you would be surprised how many wonderful people that we have have very simple things like what is a lectionary and how do you find the readings for the day they have just been so grateful um, that we've just explained it and talked through it now that's one of the examples of just really practical simple basic skills so it ranges from that to really breaking open as best as we can in 90 minutes the liturgical year and some theology of the liturgical year so it really runs the gamut of of, of those kinds of things, but that was the goal. Like who, the audience being those musicians that were either new in this ministry and had very little um, exposure or background in the liturgy, but were really great at music, right? And, or those that needed a refresher. And, and certainly not, we've had non-Catholics come because they're working in a, in a Catholic parish and they're not familiar with the Catholic liturgy. And so their pastor's like, hey, like, why don't you, you come and check this out, take this and just get a sense of, of this. Um, and, and that's been super helpful for people. Now track three, so, so I'll just finish real quick. So track one yeah. um, is, is really that introduction uh, to the mass and liturgy overall. So it really, gives you an introduction to what liturgy is. Again, basic, it's not a master's level. And then breaks open the mass and all the parts of the mass. And then track two really dives into sacraments and sacramentality. And then we, as, as quickly as one can, because um, there's so much, each of these could be a master's class, right? Um, is we go through each of the sacramental rites um, and a little theology, a little history, but really diving into the ritual itself so that you as a musician know what the order is, what the flow is, where music might be used, where it might, you know, what, what are the options, especially if you're helping prepare not only the music, but the text, because as we know, and I'm sure Amanda, you hear this a lot, like a lot of us in, in music ministry end up also by de facto just being the liturgist of the parish um, if yes. the pastor isn't taking that role. And, and so again, that, that this would be very helpful in that case. And then track three is, is a little bit different, um, is that the goal with track three was to go a little bit deeper. And it's not as uh, systematic as the first two tracks where sort of session one builds, uh, or session two builds upon session one and so forth. Track three is very topical with, with each of those. So the overall theme is liturgy, life, and discipleship. And we tried to do, with this one, 
each of the six sessions um, kind of taking on um, a little bit higher level. I don't want to say, again, it's not a master's program, um, but it's not basic in the sense of here's a lectionary. So for example, week one is liturgy in the modern world, like looking at uh, Gaudium et Spes and what what does Gaudium et Spes and the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, what does Gaudium et Spes and the current reality of our liturgical prayer and life, what does that mean for us? And what does it mean for our action in the world? And we know Pope Francis talks so much about um, and has certainly encouraged and invited us to become missionary disciples. Um, and, and what better place, obviously, is the liturgy is what transforms us into being disciples. We are sent from that. So that's one example. We talk about liturgy and evangelization, and liturgy and catechesis, and, and the mystagogical reality of our, our baptized life, um, and social justice and liturgy. The Ars Celebrande, which we've heard from Pope Benedict in uh, Sacramentum Caritatis, I think is where, where he talks about that. And certainly mm -hmm. Pope Francis has built upon that, and, uh, and others uh, have, have continued to write on that. The, the art of celebrating. Um, and if, as artists ourselves, as musicians, we're part of that. Like we need to know the pacing and the rhythm and we need to understand a little bit of the theology of that aesthetic. Like why do we do what we do and how do we participate in the beauty of the liturgy? So that mm -hmm. that's that's one of the, and that's one of my favorite ones. Um, and then the final one is liturgical spirituality that each of us in our day-to-day -day living, we, so it's, it's really kind of breaking open the Paschal mystery, the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Christ, right? And because in our planning and our daily prayer, our rising and our, our, our going to bed in the evening is a symbolic or a sign of, of that Paschal mystery. We live truly the Paschal mystery every day. We all have little dyings that we have to go through, and hopefully we, we mend and heal and we rise from those, and we rise from those in a different way. We do that daily, we do that weekly, we do that yearly, right? So our whole liturgical calendar is an unfolding of the Paschal mystery. So we are living a liturgical spirituality. And so that's what we break open in that, that final session. So I don't know if that was, that's probably too much, but that's all and all over the place, but good. No, good it's great. No, it's great. I mean, and I, I'm getting a sense too that there seems to be, maybe just from the way you just described it, but it seems like there's a difference between tracks one and two and then tra track three. You know, it, it seems like a definite difference in terms of just uh, like theme and the way that the, the topics are, you know, unfolded. Yeah, it, 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 as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's not as systematic in that sense, but it, mm -hmm. it's sort of taking what you have done in track one and two, which you don't necessarily have to have had taken those to take track three, if I say that right. Um, but what, what it's doing is it's, it's taking if, with the basic knowledge that you have and helping you raise it up a little bit more and mm -hmm. and apply it not just in skill but now in in the the thought and i'm going to be careful in using the word philosophy it's sort of how do we we have the skill and how are we going to meld the, the theological ph philosophical ideals around liturgy with the practical practical skills but I do want to emphasize it's not a master's program. So don't be, I don't want to say, because I when I use those words, I don't want people to be afraid, like, well, I'm not good at philosophy or I'm not good at theology. You are, because you're, you're in this ministry. Um, you, you come with the experience that you have of the risen Christ. You come with the experience of your parish community. That's doing theology. When you reflect on that and you break that open and think about where was God present in this or what, what did we do um, in our celebration? That's the kind of stuff we're doing here. So it isn't going back to the first century and studying and that kind of thing. That's what us liturgy nerds do. Um, and maybe you <laughs> like that, which is great. Um, but I don't want to scare people away because it is accessible and it is, it is designed for you um, to be able to apply it in your ministry. How can a pastoral musician take what they learn specifically from track three, let's say they, you know, let's say they want to commit to track three of the essentials of Catholic mm -hmm. liturgy this January, and they want to use it right away. I, how, how can they use that as a practical application in their ministry? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, maybe two examples at least come to my mind right away. Um, is so, for example, with, with the fourth session, liturgy and social justice, mm -hmm. I think in that, what we take away from the conversation that, that unfolds there is looking at not only what is the parish doing in terms of its apostolic outreach, 
Um, and, it's, and it's not just the social ministry group, right? But we begin to think about, well, how does music play a role in not only lifting up and supporting the ideals that are preached in scripture about justice, but it also invites us as music ministers then to think about what is my song of justice in the world? And I use that particularly, right? Like I too am sent from the liturgy. I too am sent to go out into the world. I don't just play the piano or the organ or sing in this place and time. Like that music forms and shapes and, and helps me understand and interpret the risen Christ in my life. It helps us put in context. Um, so we can begin to think about choosing music, again, in coordination with the, the, the cycle and the scriptures, of course, that can prompt or rouse the heart to consider the poor, the marginalized, um, in ways that maybe we don't. Or maybe even as practical as that the social ministry group who's going and, and feeding the, the homeless or visiting the imprisoned, maybe it's a way that you begin to connect with them and bringing the choir into that as part of that ministry once a month, or I'm just making things up, of course. But you can begin to think about, okay, the liturgy has implications for how we live in the world. It isn't just about our performance and the skill set we have. Because to be honest, you can be the worst singer in the world the worst pianist in the world and pray really well still, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously we all want to hear good music and, and, and be part of that. But the ultimate reality is, is that we are tran transformed in the Eucharistic liturgy to go into the world. The liturgy sends us on mission. And we're part of that as music ministers. So that's one example. The second example, and I probably could think of others, would be that liturgical spirit spirituality one, I think, I know from my own ministerial experience, it is very difficult or it has been difficult at different junctures of my life to be fervent in prayer and to remain rooted in prayer because I get bogged down or busy with, my gosh, triduum's coming and I have 5 million things to do or Christmas is coming, whatever. All the things are coming all the time because we're just constantly going, going, going. Um, and we have to learn how to step back as ministers sometimes, and we have to practice it so that it becomes habit because I'm not good at it. I'm going to admit that first, but the more we practice it, and I think that spirituality section can help us to begin to break down maybe some of our, our ideals or misconceptions, but build up. This is my prayer life. This is how the way that I am ministering and do my ministry can help support my prayer life, can help support the spirituality of, of what God is doing in my life. And, and what we do in that, that, that particular session is we talk briefly a little about like Benedictine, Franciscan spirituality, but then try to like contextualize that to say, well, there's something bigger even than what we might be familiar with. And it is the Paschal mystery of Christ and, and that we participate fully wholeheartedly um, in that because of our baptism. So those are just, you know, two examples. Um, I mean, we could go on in terms of preaching or because uh, we, we do talk about preaching in the evangelization part and uh, the catechesis and mystagogy, I think, is, is very important because music is a great tool to break open um, not only scripture, but sacramental rites sometimes. Sometimes that's how I best interact as a musician myself when I'm able to sing something that so is so well prepared and accompanies the ritual action that I am drawn into the mystery mm. in, in a way that, that I certainly am not every time I'm at mass, but there are those moments where things just click um, mm. or it just kind of comes together and the spirit is so alive and so present uh, for me. And, and that obviously happens differently for each of us in those moments. But anyway, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of a lot of different ways I think that this will will benefit. So those are just yeah some examples. Well, clearly this is a great option, I think, for all pastoral ministers, but especially pastoral musicians like we've talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and also I want to mention too, this is kind of more of a practical type of thing. And I should have mentioned it before, but on a practical note, there is a professional benefit to going through all three tracks of Essentials of Catholic Liturgy, correct? 
yeah, so this is a great a great tool. It has been very beneficial. So if you have canters um, that you're working with that you want to get through canter certification, this is a great way uh, to help them prepare for that uh, certification I I exam, I think is, is that the word mm -hmm. language you guys mm -hmm. use um, uh, for mm -hmm. that. So um, right. yeah, because it, it really helps break break a lot of that that open. That actually was where I was going with it. And I, I also want to mention too, that if you are an NPM member and you do go through all three tracks, there is a certificate that we can provide to you so that you can include that um, on your LinkedIn, which seems silly, but actually is, I think, a really yeah. great professional resource. You can also offer it to your pastor um, as something as, first off, just common knowledge that he knows that you've been doing this, um, but also maybe possibly you know, I mean, I, I hate to boil it down to this, but Timothy, you and I both know that we're both from dioceses that we're have been going through or are now going through major consolidations, yes. major consolidations of parishes. And I know that pastoral musicians' jobs can be somewhat tentative at times in the midst of that. I'm always of the opinion that anything we can do professionally, especially during these difficult times of change and reconsolidation, I think can't hurt. In pastoral ministry, Joe. No, it definitely cannot. Uh, it, it only I liked what you said. I mean, it sort of bolsters your, yes. your resume. You didn't say it that way, but like on LinkedIn, like it's going to bolster that. It's going to help um, it, it, twofold. Obviously, it's going to show that that you're you're continuing your education, formation, that sort of thing. But the other caveat with that is that it it it's showing to a pastor or a, a committee that's doing the hiring that you are invested mm -hmm. in not only continuing right. education and, and bettering yourself and, and learning that speaks volumes to a hiring committee, to a pastor who is like, okay, I'm looking for somebody that, that has that motivation uh, uh, to, to continue to engage because that means they're probably going to do the same with my assembly or with the assembly that, that they're charged with caring for. So I yeah. think I think that's very important. Yeah, I think so too. A lot of people too that work in the church today probably probably I hope I don't get you know stricken down by saying this, but I don't think a lot of people in today's church have really gotten a specific sacred music degree at a higher you know institution or a master's in theology. Many have, but not everyone. I mean, there are a lot of people right. who might be part time, you know, part time music ministers, and I think this is. I mean. I mean, to be honest, I'm thinking about doing it myself, actually, because this is such, I mean, I just think this is such a great continuing opportunity for pastoral musicians. Yeah. And, and you know, I've worked in, in two rural dioceses where there just weren't resources for things for ongoing mm -hmm. education. So this is great things, great for those kinds of places. But also, like you said, they're either part time or they really are volunteer ministers. And I don't, mm -hmm. I use, I don't like the word volunteer necessarily, but mm -hmm. they're not being paid for their work. You know, they're the right. they're the the organist at their parish, and they've been doing it for twenty years because no one else can play an instrument. Mm -hmm. And that's a little dramatic, of course, but but they're so dedicated. And uh, how do we continue to reach out to those folks who have been dedicated but also hunger to learn and maybe don't have the resources or don't know about this uh, uh, program. So if you do know somebody like that, let them know, invite them, be part part of their formation in that in that regard. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely plenty of of people out there that I think can continue uh, to to benefit from this. You also said, and and maybe I'll get in trouble for this, but um, <laughs> uh, you said you know not everybody has sacred music degrees and whatnot, and 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 certainly they don't. And, but those that, that do, even some of them who are fantastic musicians don't have a liturgy background. Mm. They have learned mm -hmm. repertoire, sacred mm -hmm. music repertoire. And I don't mean that to water it down because the mm -hmm. programs are great or anything like that, mm -hmm. but not every program is equal either mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. how it breaks open the liturgy um, or how it engages the pastoral musician in that kind of, of work. So I think again, as, as pastoral ministers, myself included, is we, can't, we have to be humble enough to admit what we don't know mm -hmm. and humble enough, and maybe humble is not the right word, but I, I think it works here, to also just be willing to be vulnerable to learn, even if we think we already know it. 
Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even today, just just today, um, and this is kind of a, a simple anecdote, anecdote, but we were coming from our daily mass here at the pastoral center, and um, my, my the assistant here in the office was just ordained a deacon, and uh, so he he was at the daily mass and and proclaimed the gospel and preached, but before the gospel, he recited the gospel acclamation. So after mass, I was like, oh, no, no, you're not supposed to sing the gospel or recite it. And so we were leaving. He's like, no, 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 that's not true. And I'm like, no, I'm 99.9% .9 sure. <laughs> and no, no, no. So I came back to the office and went back and was reading. And yeah, it, the, the, the new translation changed that. So I had, I admitted like, oh, I was wrong. Like, I remembered something that was was different, was older. Mm -hmm. So no matter how much training we have is what I'm getting at. No matter how much mm -hmm. uh, time we've been in this ministry, things change. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we we learn something that isn't accurate and we need to reorient ourselves. I mean, that certainly happened in my own ministry. Um, and so we just, we do it. I mean, that's what we do, right? We And we admit right. those places and we we come and we learn from one another. And that's the other thing I would add with, with the essentials. I have loved teaching this class when, especially track one, I, I love the groups that have gathered because it is so in, it's just so energizing when people from across the country, not only are they asking questions and, and you see the excitement, even though you don't see their faces, they're typing and they have excitement mm -hmm. with the kinds of questions they're asking. But then you see the sharing of wisdom or the, the practical knowledge, like, well, this worked in my parish. We did X, Y, and Z, and, and it worked really well. Maybe that could. So being able to collaborate with your peers, your colleagues across the country in maybe a way that you can't do always or have the time to do, or even at the conference, like, you know, our gathering, um, we sometimes don't have opportunities to share that kind of wisdom always. So I really appreciate that uh, too, is, is people uh, coming and, and realizing that they have something to offer. Like they have gifts and they have wisdom, they have insight. Um, and it isn't just the, the people presenting that are gonna dump a bunch of data at you. Um, but that that there's learning in a community, um, even if it's virtual. That's one of my personal favorite things about pastoral musicians in particular. Uh, it's it's like a little hive, if you will, where we always we're yeah. always asking questions of one another, right? It's what we do. Like, hey, what are you doing for this psalm setting? You know, um, what are yep. you doing for the yep. feast of the Holy Family? You know, I mean, like we're we're always asking each other. So that's such a nice reminder too of that interconnectedness and community that we get to pull upon for something like this. So exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you get a sense of, yeah, what's going on in you know, the Southwest. I mean, if there's somebody right. on there and you get a flavor of like, oh, like we aren't doing that on the East Coast or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, I just different, different stories, different experiences, which is good mm -hmm. to share. Right. Right. Well, Timothy, clearly I could talk with you for another half hour about this because this is so fun, but we are going to wrap up for today. If someone wants more information about any of the tracks of the Essentials of Catholic Liturgy, where do they go? Well, first and foremost, you can go to ltp.org and you should be able to just get there. I think there's a, a button there for um, the Essentials, um, or you can always call customer service, which I don't have the number right, right in front of me, but you can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. But the other, the, the direct website is uh, teocl.org. So the Essentials of Catholic Liturgy.org. So teocl.org. Right. And I'll put that customer service phone number in the show notes of this episode Perfect. as well. Yeah, Perfect. that's great. Cool. Timothy, thank you for your time today. It's so appreciated. And it was just so joyful. Thank you for sharing your love of the liturgy and your love of learning because it's very apparent. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for the invitation. And we hope to see uh, many of you um, online in the coming weeks. Sounds good. 